Hey, pal. Sorry I'm late. Oh, hey, Alex, no problem. Hey, I'm sorry I didn't give you any notice, but uh, I bought this uh, Oppenheimer hat. I thought I could do a little costume. I'm sorry I didn't let you know. I'm just Well, Josh, it came, it went, it happened. Barbenheimer weekend. It uh, probably the biggest uh, movie event of the year, and there probably won't be another one for the rest of this year. And uh, what a weekend it was. We saw both movies together. We saw Barbie first, and then we saw Oppenheimer. And I got to say, for the first time in a long time, it felt like movie theaters are alive again. Parking lots were full. Lo concessions lines were stacked. Theaters were absolutely full and it kind of gave me a warm feeling despite not liking packed theaters it was it was very nostalgic like for the first time probably since the end of the mcu so i i mean what are your thoughts about this whole thing are movie theaters back because of this i think that every few years um not necessarily a double feature like this but every few years there's always something that seems to come along right at the right time when movie theaters aren't doing well every time there's a little bit of a lull something comes along it just happened to be this however i would say that this is probably right behind endgame in terms of the movie event of the decade and endgame was actually 2019 so this could be the movie event of the decade yeah i mean i looked at the movies slated for the rest of the year and i feel like this is it like it's going to be a lull for a long time and Post-Endgame, post-COVID, it's been like a rut. Barbie, opening weekend, domestic, 155 uh, million, looks like. Oppenheimer, uh, 80 million, 500,000. Wow, that's uh, quite a big difference. But my theory is, if you looked at all the showtimes for the theaters, Barbie just had so many slots, and Oppenheimer like had a lot less slots. So you got to think, three-hour movie, and it's rated R. Yeah. So that's that also like almost cuts in half. It's interesting because I did predict a few weeks ago when I was, uh, if you watch us on Patreon, you heard this in one of our uncut reactions, even though I'm not sure which episode it was of the animated series, but we were just talking offhand about it. And I said, I think, I said, I think Barbie might actually take the number one spot, but even I didn't expect it to literally double Oppenheimer's performance domestically. But I think after seeing both movies and seeing the crowds at both movies, which by the way, both showings that we went to were both sold out. So it wasn't like there was a huge disparity, but just seeing the crowds that were there, it made sense to me why Barbie ran away with it so much. And I think it's just the marketing, like the hype they've been able to cultivate around the movie with all of the collabs with so many companies that have been doing this. Everyone was wearing pink or of some kind or dressed up of some kind in the theater. It was just kind of regardless of the movie's quality. Yes, people were looking forward to the movie, but it was one of those people were just looking forward to the experience of going to the movie. Yes, for the first time in years, it felt like an event again instead of just going to see a movie. I'm, I love going to the movies just for seeing a movie. I love small small showings, but it's like back to that Star Wars feeling, that like peak MCU feel like that warm like we're going like we're going to an event type feeling. Is Which it's funny that Barbie is the one that does it because <laughs> it, I mean like not that I have anything against Barbie, but it's like, yeah, Barbie movie, that'll be cool. I didn't expect it to have this much hype around it. I had no idea. But I do think one thing we're gonna uh, be seeing because of this is a lot of studios trying to push simultaneous movie releases. But the thing with Barbenheimer was it was organic. It was totally an online thing. The studios did not plan this. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. And now it's gonna be, they're gonna try to pre-plan it. It's gonna be a disaster. <laughs> yeah. The next one slated, I believe, on the same day is Saw and uh, Paw Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I probably won't do the same uh, as big as event-wise as this, but I just think that's funny. And the other big thing affecting this weekend's release, or I guess kind of making it seem different than normal, is the actor strike happening literally during the Oppenheimer premiere. The actors <laughs> left because the strike began. Yeah, uh, I just, I support uh, the workers. I support, like, creativity. I don't want, like, TV shows, everything written by AI. We both prefer prefer practical effects. Yes, you have your Hollywood A-listers, but there's so many, so many people, so many writers, so many actors that are just like, it's like same thing with like, I don't know, billionaires and like regular workers. Like there's a huge separation. So I definitely feel like these people who are working so hard, barely making ends meet, these people deserve, uh, deserve to, you know, live 
Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? I don't disagree uh, with that. <laughs> not, not saying they're on death row, but like live on what, live with their job. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? But we shall see what happens with that. Yes. But anyway, I think we should discuss these movies. But since it is a kind of a versus type thing, even though it's not really that they're co-promoting, I think we should decide what we talk about first with a coin toss. All right. Heads is going to be Barbie. And Tails is going to be Oppenheimer, because on the back of this coin there's a little uh, war thing going on, so I feel like that's uh, that's fitting. Barbie. Barbie it is. You can find me under the lights, diamonds under my eyes. This is the best day ever. It is the best day ever. So is yesterday, and so is tomorrow, and every day from now until forever. You are dressed as Ken, so I'll let you go first. Uh, my general expectations going in is that it was just going to be a big, ridiculous pink uh, party. Like, it was going to be nothing but gags, references to uh, old Barbie stuff. You know, the uh, opening and the uh, the trailer had a 2001 A Space Odyssey uh, tribute. So I'm like, oh, yeah. that's cool. That That's awesome. And just my overall feelings on the film is I liked it a lot. I did. Ryan Gosling and Will Ferrell are probably my favorite parts the comedy like uh, for me it didn't land too much and a lot of the things it's a very politically driven movie i feel like and it's very on the nose it's very like hey stupid you know what i mean and you say oh it's a barbie movie it's you know if it's for you know young girls but margot robbie said in an interview is like this movie is literally for everyone but it feels very you know just for these you know these young women growing up and the world sucks I get it. it. It sucks for young women in the world. And I feel like as two white guys, we should come. <laughs> Our opinion is what's needed here. <laughs> I always talk about Nope. Like, Nope is like a have your cake and eat it too kind of type movie where it's like on the surface level, oh, it's an alien movie. You know, but like if you really, you know, pick up on the themes of what they're trying to say about the industry, it's a very politically and ethically driven movie. I mean, Get Out, too, you could say that. Yeah. You know, Jordan Peele's other uh, other big film, Us, I think there's some messaging in there, but I haven't picked up on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, How about you? Yeah, so there's a lot to jump into. First, I'll just start with my just my thoughts on the movie before we jump into all, all that stuff. So, first of all, I was very excited for the movie. But unlike Oppenheimer, where I, where I felt like I had a grasp on what it was going to be, with Barbie, I was like, this movie could either be excellent and amazing or it could be terrible i had no idea what to expect um because obviously you have a product like barbie and margot robbie being perfect casting ken being great uh casting of ryan gosling i think we talked about it uh just off camera once and i said i expected it to be uh kind of a carbon copy of elf where she's going to be in barbie land for 15 minutes have some reason to go to the real world and then the movie's going to take place in the real world and that's all we see of barbie world which is not the case and i'm glad that's not the case that i was wrong um, to cut to the chase, I like the movie also. Um, I think that for me, the comedy worked a bit more than I think it did for you, mostly because I, I do not expect any comedy to have 100% hits. Like, that's never going to happen. You're always going to have some jokes that don't really land. But for me, it did more jokes made me, make me laugh than not. And yes, they did. I didn't expect to find Will Ferrell's comedy funny at all in the movie because his character is just so, like, I don't, I don't want to say useless, but it's just so like in there for no reason. But he had one of the funniest jokes in the movie, which I won't spoil, but Michael Sarah was hilarious as Alan in the movie. Ryan Gosling does excellent with what he's given. Obviously, Margot Robbie does excellent with what she's given. And everyone overall, I thought, did a great job. So it made the comedy work for me. But of course, there were some jokes that just fell flat. But I just feel like that's always going to happen. Um, the story, I thought, was good and not what I expected in terms of where they went with it. Um, I was pleasantly surprised that I was never bored and I never felt that it was too predictable in what they were going to do. It didn't blow me away. It's not a perfect movie. Uh, if someone doesn't like it, I totally understand. And I do think the messaging is very, very on the nose. And while I agree with the messaging, I feel like you could not be so cringe about it at points. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's in terms of plot, there really isn't that much. It's very simple. It's very mm -hmm. everything feels very shallow in that sense. Like they're so focused on getting this message out, and it's weird because Noah Baumbach co-wrote this thing, but it, it feel like like almost like it doesn't. I don't know. You look at Marriage Story, and look how like Marriage Story is one of those where it's like. Like, this is so real, I'm uncomfortable. Like, this is a real-life thing that can happen, and it's, like, it's making me, like, 
that that's one of the toughest watches ever. I love that movie. Even jumping over to Greta Gerwig with Lady Bird. I think Lady Bird is an excellent movie. And like Mare's Story, it feels like realistic and the characters seem real in the movie, like real people. But like with this, it just felt like very like, you know, it's like, eh, it's like some cringe dialogue, like some good moments in there. Like there's a very beautiful moment with Bar when Barbie's on a bench with uh, the old woman. That scene was perfect. And apparently like Greta Gerwig fought to keep that scene in. Mm. And I, I can imagine, I, if they took that scene out, you know, that would suck. Bummer, yeah. Yeah, that was a bummer. Set design, beautiful. The pink, everything looked yeah, super real. Yeah. Nothing felt like CG or painted on. Like, you know, the traveling scenes felt very elf-like as well. You know, like, obviously that's, you know, mm -hmm. not real. But everything, like the costumes, and gorgeous. If Ryan Gosling wasn't such a damn good actor, like, this movie could have been not good. Like, with what his character is given... He knocks it out of the park with what he's supposed to do, but you could have put in so many actors there that wouldn't have hit that tone correctly, and it would have made it, you know, just kind of fall apart, in my opinion. But he's so good, and I'm not even saying the material given to him is bad, it's just a difficult role to play, where you're really this, uh, I don't want to get too much into spoilers, but you're really this person in the movie who you're set up a certain way, and then your character has to completely change but by the end, you still kind of have to be that character from the beginning of the movie. Like, it's hard to describe without getting into spoilers, but it's like, he really, as dumb as it seems to say, because you watch the movie and he's fuck, and he's Ken from Barbie, right? But the range he had to have in the movie, both in a humorous way and in a serious way, was, I think, the hardest actual job of the movie. And I think he did it so well, and that's what made the movie actually come together for me. Yeah, I'm picturing, like, literally any other actor trying that, I would... I don't think it'd work. Yeah, I, I think. Like, tr look. At, imagine Timothy Chalamet trying to uh, do that. Oh <laughs> God, no. Yeah. Nope. Scratch that. Reverse it. I would recommend this film. I liked a lot about it. Some parts I didn't, but you know, that's that's every film. There's very few things where I just love everything about it. But uh, I think it's a good watch. It's a good watch. It's entertaining. A bit too long, in my opinion. Just cut about nine. Shit, about nine, ten minutes off of there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, go see it. Yeah, I definitely do as well. The only thing I'm going to caveat is that this movie isn't a kid's movie, but I also don't really sympathize with anyone complaining about that because it's rated PG-13, and I've never liked people, especially parents, who don't pay attention to movie ratings and then get mad at the movie. You know what I mean? Like parents who went to Sausage Party with their kids, <laughs> even though it's rated R, thinking like, oh, it's a cartoon about food, and then getting angry. It's the same thing with this, not to that extent. But there are very inappropriate jokes in this movie for kids that are of a certain age. And if you're a parent who takes your five-year-old to a PG-13 movie and gets mad that they're saying penis or vagina, then it's like, eh, that's on you. Yeah. You know, that's that's on you as a parent. Don't get mad at the movie. But I will caveat that, keep that in mind. But beyond that, um, yeah, I, I would definitely recommend it. I didn't even know it was PG-13. What did you think it was? Just PG? Just PG, yeah. I, I didn't even bother to check the rating. Cause... It doesn't matter for you. Yeah, it doesn't matter for me. Yeah, I, I'm not taking a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's jump to the spoilers, and I think we have to talk more about the now about the political messaging of it. Uh, now that we can get in depth to it, so mm -hmm. the whole thing with Ken watching it, I it, I was curious how you were going to think about it because first of all, you dressed up as Ken going to the movie, <laughs> and I think every I've seen a lot of stuff online where it's like my boyfriend went dressed as Ken and you know had a breakdown in the movie where Ken is essentially becomes the villain. Because yeah. as they go into the real world, he discovers patriarchy, which were some of the funniest scenes in the movie. And again, if done poorly, could have been really bad. There's, of course, a lot of cringe people, in my opinion, cringe, online already talking about, oh, this is a woke feminist movie, man-hating movie. And it's like, first of all, you're going to a movie that's, it's literally Barbie. <laughs> it's Barbie. <laughs> what did you expect? <laughs> and again, this could have been complete cringe, complete, you know, all men are bad. And even though they really don't work that hard to make the men as uh, redeemable by the end as I would have liked to see, Ryan Gosling, again, just kind of saves it. Because even when he's the biggest dick in the movie, he's still hilarious, and you still, like, somewhat sympathize with him the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I will agree. I mean, that's the one thing, like, with the men in this movie, that, they're, like, none of them have any redeeming qualities. To the point where Margot Robbie, you know, like, in public, in front of, like, a bunch of people, like construction workers, like uh, the whistling thing, and you know, smacks her on the ass. It's like, I'm a guy, so I don't know. That doesn't happen to me. I'm sure it, maybe that does happen today, but mm -hmm. it, it was all like so much dudes suck. It's like, Jesus. And like at the end, where it's like, you're going to come up with uh, like a solution, like, but, oh, yeah, maybe one day, you know, Ken will get on the Supreme Court, like, and you'll have as much power as, you know, women in the Supreme Court, like what the narrator says. It's like, oh, God. 
like wouldn't it be nice to have like a message where it's like where you know like equality or it's like you know what i mean like we're the yeah. me- you know it's like so we can live together and in, in harmony in this world but now it's like oh you, like i don't know that kind of rubbed me the wrong way yeah so here's what's really funny I also wasn't was thought some of it wasn't well done, but all of the jokes you just brought up, I thought were the best ones about that topic. I was annoyed by uh, other stuff, but first, let me give play devil's advocate for what what you brought up. So the thing when they go into the real world and all the stuff where she's obviously being sexually harassed and you know she's making jokes about like I feel da- in danger but don't know why. I'm a really big fan of like show don't tell you know what I mean and in that scene I felt that the whole fish out of water thing which has been done a million times now in movies was done well and it's okay to be obnoxious and over the top in that scene because she's literally just coming to the real world for the first time so I try to think of it from a perspective of like this isn't the perspective this character as a normal woman who's walking around the world it's like Barbie literally coming to the real world to her, it's going to look and seem more shocking. So they have to play it up in the movie as more shocking. Okay, like if yeah. it was all just subtle stuff going on and she's like, this is really weird, it wouldn't make sense. Like it has to be the over the top construction worker stuff. And I also thought that was one of the funniest jokes when they're clearly like hitting on her and she realizes what's going on and she's like, just so you know, I don't have a vagina. Because that's something that would not happen, you know, in the real world, someone responding like that. Uh, because she is a doll <laughs> and she's like, and he doesn't have a penis, you know. It's okay. playing the actual plot of the movie into the messaging and everything, which I think is, is nice okay. yeah. about the Supreme Court thing. I also, originally, when they were going through the ending, I was like, I hope the point of this at the end is that they're like, hey, Barbie Land was all for women and men had nothing to do. The real world is opposite. We have to work together, you know, in, in, in equality to make it work. Like, that typically should be the message, you'd think. However, I thought the joke about political power was so funny that it was like, I was more okay with with what they ended up doing. The way they delivered it to me, I was like, that's so true. Like, they didn't say, like, the men are never going to have power. They just said, yeah, they'll have power. It's just going to take them a very long time. Because that is what it's been like for women. Like, a hundred years ago, they were given the right to vote. And now a hundred years later, they have a lot more power. But it took them a very long time. So if you're in this fictional land where men have zero influence or power, you can't instantly give them 50% power. Like, it's going to take them a lot of time. Now, this is thinking really deep into a stupid comedy movie. But I hadn't even thought about that. That when they made that joke, I was like, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. For me, the worst part America was her. America for our speech. <laughs> Her and her daughter's like relationship like was just felt like a last minute write in, like mm-hmm. it felt so flat and like they didn't even like have an arc for themselves. And the twist that it was actually the adults Barbie instead of the kids Barbie was so obvious. Yeah, I I, I agree. My problem with the speech again, and I just want to stress. I agree with what she's saying in the speech, and I am not a woman, so I couldn't even dispute that even if I wanted to, everything she says in the speech. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You'd have to ask a woman. But to me, that was the biggest point of the movie that's like, hey, this, this is the message. And I don't care what the message is or whether I agree with it or not. Any movie that delivers its message in a grandiose speech to the audience through the main character, I just don't like. I thought the movie was actually doing a pretty good job throughout to when it got to that part. I'm like, ugh, don't do this now. Like, yeah. every scene, like, with Margot Robbie, like, trying to figure out who she is as Barbie, like, you know, like, all these other, you know, women or everything, like, what am I? Like, that was the good stuff in my in my feeling. And it's, like, finding out that, like, she's enough on her own. Like, that was... And the scene of the park bench where she's, you know, realizing what humanity is with the old lady and, like, all that, like, becoming almost, like, self-aware to the real world. All that stuff was great. But the stuff with, like, America, it was just, like, ugh, You know what I mean? It's, like, yeah. it's... I don't know. I felt like maybe that should have been given to... Because we didn't see America go through anything. Yeah, I, I'm going to have something to add to that. But just to jump off of the political messaging aspect of it, I just wish, which I say this about so many movies, I just wish it trusted the audience more. So much of the movie, I felt, was on the right track that, like, those moments when they came out, it was kind of, like... I was like, okay, like you were doing it good. Like you were doing it well. You know what I mean? Because look, at the end of the day, Hollywood is always going to have a liberal undertone, you know? And it's like, if you're not a liberal, sorry, you lost the arts. Like, you know what I mean? It's like liberals took over the arts. That's your fault for letting that happen. But with that being said, leave it to be the undertones. You know what I mean? Like you were talking about with Nope. It's like, make the movie good and then have those undertones there, don't scream it in my face. Uh, Even if I agree with your messaging, I'm still going to think it's annoying. Back to what you were saying about the America Ferreira part of it, 
I feel like this movie had so many storylines that unfortunately we couldn't dive that deep into any of them. Like there was a the America Ferrera and her daughter storyline, Will Ferrell storyline, Ryan Gosling storyline, and Margot Robbie storyline, and then all the weird throwaway gags they had to put in the movie, homages to the Barbie brand, all this stuff. It all just added up to like a whole bunch of stuff, almost like a skit movie. You know what I mean? Where mm-hmm. it was like, couldn't you cut out? Like I feel like you could have just cut out all the Mattel stuff. Or if you want to keep that and do more of that, cut out something else. You know, it was just like so much was in there in an already two-hour movie that everything only got like 20 minutes, when you know, when you put it all together. Weird Barbie, I think, was uh, the best part. Kate McKinnon? Kate McKinnon. She's a great job. Weird a role Barbie perfectly was... made for her. Perfectly made, perfectly casted, perfectly acted. And I, th- I think we've all seen a Weird Barbie in real life that, yep. like, you know, a sister or a cousin or whatever just completely mangled. And the I think the ending, too. With uh, Barbie saying, like, you know, Ken's arc, where it's like, it's Barbie and Ken. And, like, th- they almost really had me, where it's like, no, you got to figure out who you are. Mm-hmm. Like, you are Ken enough. Ken enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I am Ken enough, yeah. Ken enough, yeah. Like, that stuff was great. And then the ending with the whole, mm-hmm, you know, it's, <laughs> like, it's like, oh. Yeah, it's just a little bit frustrating when it's so close to, like, being amazing. And it just ends up being like, okay, yeah, that's pretty good. We gotta get another message. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? It's like it was there. It was already. There. I got it. <laughs> yeah. I got it. But it's yeah. like I always, I always talk about the ending of Black Klansman, just showing real life news footage of like <laughs> yeah. you know Donald Trump or whatever. It's like it's like I, we just watched the movie. I was just on board. <laughs> I'm I, I I'm aware of like the racist things that are happening. Yeah, and you know, and we have to be fair about that because so many times as like movie audiences, we always are like, oh. Just let filmmakers do what they want. Studios just think everyone is stupid, and they just want to make everything dumb for audiences. Sometimes filmmakers think you're stupid, too. <laughs> you know, like, it's not just the studio. The filmmaker's afraid you're not going to understand what they're saying. So they, you know, hammer things home. And uh, that's unfortunate. But that's the equivalent, you know, it's, films are, like, are made to be interpreted. Like, mm-hmm. there's so many films out there where you take away what you got from it. Like, some, yeah. sometimes there is no answer. That's like the ending of the movie. The director comes out. Okay, so what I did with this scene, like, <laughs> yeah. like right at, like, just eliminate your thought process and yeah. tell you what they want. I'm also a huge believer of death of the author and that it doesn't matter if author in a general sense. It can be a director, screenwriter, whatever, uh, or an actual author of a book. But it, it doesn't matter to me what the person who made the thing thinks about the thing. I don't care. What I care about is what I took from the thing and how I interpret it and discussing with other people how they interpreted it. So anytime people are having a discussion about film and someone tries to come in and say, well, actually, the director said this. It's like, I don't care. They made the movie how they wanted. Now I get to interpret it how I want. You know what I mean? It's out of his hands now. He published it. It's mine. I bought yeah. and paid for it. I get to have my thoughts about it. Exactly. Art deserves to be discussed and critiqued and, yeah, just talk about things. It's nice when there's something to talk about rather than, okay, they told me what it's about. What's there to talk about? You know what I mean? <laughs> Even if the person making it has a particular what they think and what they made it, if they can make it to where you can still take away different interpretations, that makes it even better. If you want to talk about something that's even harder to have your own interpretation than Barbie, how about a historical biopic? (laughs) (laughs) We think there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world. Chances are near zero. So we saw Barbie and Oppenheimer not on the same calendar day, but within uh, 24 hours of each other. Um, And... Oppenheimer is a three-hour film. We saw it second after seeing Barbie. And this one, I felt like I kind of knew what it was going to be going into it. And I feel like I mostly was correct. I fell in love with movies because of Inception. I saw Inception was the first ever movie I saw in IMAX. And I was 14, fell in love with movies. Um, I love The Prestige. I love all of his Batman films. I love Memento. I think even his earlier movies are pretty good. Um, And... Interstellar, I think, is really good as well. Um, I think I might have forgotten a couple in there. In that whole timeline, ending with Interstellar. Dunkirk, for me, I'm not a war movie guy. I thought Dunkirk was fine. Tom Hardy flying around in a plane, it was cool. (laughs) You know, whatever, it was fine. Tenet came out right in the middle of a pandemic, terrible timing. I couldn't hear anything anybody was saying. I haven't watched, rewatched it with captions, and I don't really feel like it. So uh, it was disappointing to me because I love Robert Pattinson and J- John David Washington. I think is a great actor, but that movie for me just didn't didn't really work. So with that being said, I think Oppenheimer is Christopher Nolan's best movie since Interstellar. 
<laughs> which <in> or <laughs> which okay. isn't a high bar, <laughs> but I it was a good movie. I will agree. It. Uh, I think I, I didn't tell you. I saw it twice. I saw it again. Oh, okay. I went and saw it again because there is a lot of moving pieces. It's very fast for a three-hour movie, and I uh, speaking of nope, talking about spectacle. Like every single one of Nolan's films has a bit of a spectacle. And this is the one where, like, the only spectacle was, like, the bomb. So there's really not much, like, there's no action set pieces. It's all dialogue-driven, and, like, it was a lot. It was a lot to take in. There's, like, four different scenes almost happening, not at once, but cutting in back and forth. So, but I loved it. I was so intrigued by it. I was so afraid I missed something. I went and saw it again. And even then, I'm like, holy shit, <laughs> this is a lot. I started listening to, like, an Oppenheimer doc documentary because I was so intrigued by this story. And like what he did with like so uh, with so little, it's amazing. I, I I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Like I'm fascinated. I love when a movie comes out and it just completely uh, invades my whole thought process. I can't think about anything else. I want to learn more about the story. I want to dive deeper. I might see it a third time, and it's great. It's it went faster than Barbie for me, <laughs> both yeah. times. Yeah, I really liked it. I'll, I'll first say that, uh, I'm not the first one to say this, but if Robert Downey Jr. and Killian Murphy both get nominated for Oscars, I wouldn't be surprised. Both are excellent in the movie, uh, and they're kind of like the two biggest uh, roles in the film because the two storylines jumping back and forth between them. Again, no one using time of jumping back and forth with time, but with this... You know, he does it in almost all of his films, but in a lot of his films like this, it's not so in your face. Like, he's doing it, jumping back and forth many years in time, but it's not like Tenet or Inception, uh, you know, or Memento, where it's like the whole gimmick. Yeah, it's not ridiculous. It's just, it's not a part of the gimmick. It's just yeah. the way he's telling the story. It's, yeah. it's not like you're forgetting every 15 minutes. It's just jumping back and, and forth. And I loved the difference of the timeline being the future timeline or the more later timeline being the black and white with Robert Downey Jr. And then when any time it would go, go to a little bit further to the past, it being in color. The, it's a movie where it's like acting, you know what I mean? And the acting is great. So that's good because you have to have good acting in an acting movie. You not, know? not only great acting, but some of the actors are giving are given so little because there's so much. And like, think of an actor, he's probably in this movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Benny Safty as a uh, uh, teller. Matt Damon, like, I don't know what it is, but with Matt Damon's career, his resurgence, like, I don't know, he's had those, like, shitty movies, like, downsizing, but, like, I don't know, like, post-Martian, he's had air, he's had this, like, he's had that, uh, The Last Duel, like, he's just crushing it out there. Love to see yeah. it. Uh, Robert Downer Jr., just, like, I don't know, like, post-Iron Man and, like, that Doolittle, like, I don't think that counts, but, like, th this movie proved, like, like, what does this guy, you know, it's like... He, I, I want to see him in like every platform ever. He is just on another level. Like that's why he is who he is. I just wish we, I, we didn't see him Iron Man. It was it was great to see him as Iron Man for like what twelve years or whatever. But I wish mm -hmm. we saw him like more and stuff like this. Holy shit! Well, I feel like he's entered. He's entering that phase of like he had his whole situation after his early years. Came back. It was Iron Man for a decade, and now he's entering that like I don't want to say post prime because he's. This is one of his best performances ever, but like where he's that older, you know, more veteran actor where I think the next 10, 15 years, hopefully we just get like amazing performances from him. I hope so. And uh, obviously everyone did great, but also like Jason Clark, uh, the bad lawyer, like uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes guy, like yeah. him, like he is just like he was born like to be a villain. I don't know yeah. like, what is like his parents just produced a perfect villain baby. Like he just has that, <laughs> he just has that face where it's like I was getting like so like just a scumbag. <sighs> yeah. And uh, Florence Pugh and Emily Blunt also, like, everyone. I, I can talk about every actor in this, like, undeniably, forever. I, I don't think it's any surprise that Emily Blunt is an excellent actor at this point, but I think she's my favorite performance of the movie. I mean, really? she didn't have that much to do, but every scene she was in and everything she does was some of my favorite parts. I'm sure we'll talk more in spoilers about it. Mm -hmm. But the little that she had... You know, comparative to everyone else, if you're looking at amounts trying to even them out, it's, it's hard to do. But com for what she had, she gave some of the best moments and performances of this movie. Uh, without spoiling, I'll just say the scene where she's being interrogated is one of the best scenes of the movie. And there's, and there's plenty of other ones, too. The most fascinating part of this film is just watching this guy with his, you know, who, like he's had what he is having his visions and like what it becomes because of the place in the world that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, like, what's needed of him and what he decides to do. And, like, how things just keep rolling along with him. But it's, like, as it goes on, it's, like, holy shit. You know, we're 
we're building a bomb. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, and the effects of that, and the scene, you know, Killian's performance with this, and one of my f favorite scenes is just like any scene where he's just like staring off. And yeah. he, you can see everything he's thinking. He's not saying anything. This the way this guy acts. Oppenheimer was not a perfect movie. Like I said, it's his best movie since Interstellar, which was only three movies ago. Um, and I wouldn't consider it better than almost any movie before Interstellar that he made either. Um, because for me, this movie was excellent for what it was and like what it wanted to be. It did everything it wanted to extremely well. I, I just judge Nolan on a curve. Like I just judge him on a higher standard. If if no one wasn't the director and it was a, a pseudonym or something, but it was the same exact movie, I'd be like, this movie's amazing. But because it's Christopher Nolan, oh, okay. I just felt like I was sold something that I didn't get. Like, what I got was like a three-hour drama of people talking in like a political drama and all this stuff, and that was really good. But like, I you know, I feel like we were a little bit ripped off in the sense of like, no one would do these things throughout the movie that made you think it was about to like hit the next level. And it just, for me, didn't. Look back to the, the teaser trailer for this movie. The big, the big countdown to next year and the flashes of the big explosions. This was sold as like, go see this in IMAX and see a fucking nuclear bomb. You know what I mean? We got a really cool story about Oppenheimer. This guy I knew zero about before seeing this movie. And there were really great performances. But I just kind of wish a different movie was made in some ways. Like, I wanted to see a movie about the atomic bomb, not necessarily about Oppenheimer, but the movie's called Oppenheimer, so I can't really blame it too much for that. Yeah, my response to that is going to have to be in spoilers. Just, yeah. So, But there you go. Um, but obviously, I recommend the movie, though. I mean, it's long. If you're someone who doesn't like long movies of people talking, you might think it's boring, but I think uh, it wasn't boring. I think the pacing was excellent and it jumps around a lot and uh, the scenes are all like quick dialogue you know yeah that, that's the thing i was saying like there's very little spectacle so it's to fill that in it's just dialogue there's very there's no action set pieces i mean there's stuff with the bomb but that's the thing you really got to like strap in because sometimes i struggle with this where sometimes real life dwindles in in my thoughts while i'm watching something <laughs> yeah it's like oh man i gotta do this oh shit shit yeah, yeah. like all this dialogue's going on so it's like that's why i went and saw it again because sometimes real life just drifts in and it sucks that's why i need subtitles so i can always see it what yeah. they're saying so i would recommend seeing this film one or two times to really soak it in all right, spoilers. You want right, to just start spoilers. by responding to my non-spoiler? Yeah. Right? So you're talking about yeah, it's uh, it's from two perspectives. It's all Oppenheimer's perspective in color, and everything in black and white is Strauss's perspective. So that was my thing. Like everything is from just Oppenheimer's perspective on everything. Because there was a two battling perspectives. So it's like, yeah. I mean, yeah. The whole marketing. Yes, like, drop the bomb, and we did see the bomb drop. It, the, the, the test. test the yeah. test bomb. Like, the build-up to that, in my opinion, was absolutely fantastic. And, like, almost a bait-and-switch where it's, like, silent after it explodes. So I'm like, ah, oh, they got us. And then, like, a minute later, you know. Yeah. That, that was pretty cool in IMAX. But I will agree, yeah, like, it's definitely a film that could have not been in IMAX, I feel like. You know what I mean? There wasn't, yeah. there wasn't any fantastical big shots like the explosion was cool because I know like the whole thing was like oh no CG used yeah he didn't use a, sh a single shot of CGI he claims yeah it's, you ever hear that phrase it's like if he wanted to he would you know what I mean it's like if no one wanted to he would you know he didn't want to with this movie which is like perfectly fine I mean, make whatever movie you want but then like just don't sell that movie to me you know what I mean because it's like marketing aside I understand he doesn't control 100% of the marketing but the film even within the film from the very beginning, when you're seeing like Oppenheimer go through school and everything, you're jarringly interrupted with just like frames of big like, you know, space and like things, you know, freaking out and bombs. This is all throughout the movie. Like how that cannot be seen as like a tease for what's to come. Like that's clearly what it should be. And then we get the tests and everything. And I understand that that's the only bomb that Oppenheimer saw physically. Like I get that. Mm -hmm. But then... After that happens, there's the whole sequence, which ironically ends up being the loudest sequence in the movie, where he like goes into that crowd of people and everyone's like cheering. Yes, for I love. I thought that whole in the trailers, the ch -ch, like I thought that was part of like the bomb, but no, it's <laughs> it's the people cheering, the people yeah. cheering for like this horrible thing. I thought that was a very interesting choice. Yeah, it was and good. like and him like, like what have I done? And what I was talking about earlier, non spoilers, like. He, he has this thing in his mind, like this whole thing about quantum physics. Like he started the school in America because it was big uh, in Europe and he brings it over here. And he's like, 
and uh, like almost like a victim of like what the time like what if there wasn't a war going on like what would he use with this quantum physics oh, wow, yeah. you know what I mean because uh, like oh Hitler and, like they just discover something and then they bring in the newspaper oh Hitler invades Poland and they're starting to get worried about a bomb so like he almost gets like recruited to build up use his brain for this bomb but I'm wondering like what would he, what would he be doing like what would yeah. the quantum physics be done if it wasn't in that time period yeah that's and, a good point you know what I mean we'll never know yeah, yeah. that's interesting and I feel like the stuff with his mind like as it goes on like he has these visions like he wants to make something you know like you know all this stuff with the camera and as it goes on that goes away and then he starts getting you know, like the visions like the stuff like after he builds the bomb where it's like you know the people cheering and then all of a sudden it goes white they're gone flesh peeling and all that vision of what it could be done goes away and now it's just like oh what have i done mm -hmm. almost you know what i mean and that's where again like yeah it would have been cool to see a, a more of an atomic bomb but also like when that scene was happening i thought it was really good and i was like okay now we're gonna see like this guy's psychotic break of like what did i do and we're gonna see like these crazy visions and like we really don't like that's really the extent of it yeah and then it goes into okay now here's this trial I want to see his personal fallout of what he's done. But instead, it's more focused on, like, the government fallout and what uh, Strauss does to him and then Strauss come up. And that was all great. That was great stuff. But, like, then the movie ends when, you know, he's talking to Albert Einstein. And, and But the ending there, you know, the obviously the famous, you know, the ending line. He's like, we thought we would cause a chain reaction. He's like, I think we did. And the shots of all the bombs going off. And then the movie ends. And I'm like, okay, I wanted to see more of that. Like, and I understand I was talking with my wife about this after we saw the movie. I'm like, it's not Christopher Nolan's job or responsibility to, like, try to make a movie debating the consequences or the morality of, like, nuclear weapons. Like, that's a very complex topic. I'm not expecting Christopher Nolan to have all the answers. But at the same time, you're making a movie about the guy who, like, made this bomb. Like, can we dive deeper into what this dude thinks about it? Or, like, you know what I mean? Like, what Albert Einstein might think about it. But instead, we just get... That ending moment, and then that's it. That I just felt a little bit cold by that. It's kind of like, can we, can we, can we kind of dive in more? You know, it's it's already three hours. But yeah, like, I, yeah. I just felt like they were, he just left that open to, to, with his face. Like, what does he think about it? Like, mm -hmm. I think we did like create something that you know end the world. You were right. Like, they never go to that next level. Like, I wanted to see more when he starts like freaking out, and like he steps through like the carcass body. Yeah. Like, I wanted to see more weird stuff in this yeah as i love seeing uh, young characters like and as i think a great example is wolf of wall street where it's like they're young and like happy and like as the film goes on they become like this jaded you know mm -hmm. like miserable like the difference between uh leo in the beginning of wolf and wall street and end and then the beginning of like smiley you know uh killian murphy and at the end it's just like like a full a full like character arc yeah you love to see it yeah, man. I think this one was special. Yeah. I realized it, it didn't uh, go to that next level in certain aspects, but I just love the perspectives of and performances of Robert Downey Jr. and Killian Murphy and these two characters. And, yeah, I want to see it again. Yeah, the, for, for the problems I do have with it, they're small, and, again, they're graded on a curve because it's Nolan. This movie is excellent. Um, so I think both movies we talked about are very good and would be, I haven't done like a list or anything for this year, but they'd probably be up there. Uh, Creed three is probably still my favorite this year though. So really? Far, honestly. Really? Um, but yeah. Anything else? Nope. That's it. We're done. <laughs>